All right. Welcome back, everyone, to our afternoon session. Uh, the first speaker is Scott Morrison from AMU. He'll be telling us all about fusion categories. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, I'd like to thank both the Steve and all the organizers uh, for inviting me along. I'm hoping that they don't shortly regret it, as uh, <laughs> I am possibly the least physically literate of all the speakers on the, on the calendar. Um, so we'll see how it goes. I will um, attempt to not be a crazy mathematician who only talks about abstract nonsense the whole time. I do want to emphasize that my interest in this subject uh, really is in the very concrete examples. I do numerics, I do big combinatorial searches, I look at particular instances of things, and I hope some that are maybe interesting to, to people in the field. Uh, that all said, I'm going to begin the talk with a bit of what is, I guess, abstract nonsense, which is just going to be uh, a mathematician's perspective on the relationship between topological field theories and fusion categories. Uh, I think a lot of what I say in the first 20 minutes of the talk has been said in bits and pieces by other people already at the conference, uh, and so maybe it won't be particularly exciting from the point of view of, of a physicist. Um, but I want to say it again anyway, so we're all on the same page. Uh, and I want to point out one or two little places where uh, recent developments in mathematics don't quite coincide with what everyone's thought is the way things work all along. Okay, so the, this is the plan of the tour. Um, I just want to start right at the beginning and say, what is a, a two-dimensional topological field theory? Uh, I then want to explain the, the, the correspondence between uh, local 2D TFTs and fusion categories. And then all of that is really uh, motivation for you know, trying to convince you that it's a reasonable thing to go away and think about these things, fusion categories, uh, which are at first sight very algebraic objects, uh, don't necessarily have anything to do with Everything else, but obviously, this is all motivation for thinking about this algebraic subject. And then I want to finish up by telling you what we've been learning in the last couple of years about uh, the phenomenology of fusion categories. We're very, very far from classification in the sense that mathematicians really aspire to, but we have examples and we have indications of what the story is. Okay, so let's start right back at the beginning uh, with what is a, a 2D topological field. So it's a functor from, uh, from two cob to vec. And all of that means is that uh, for each surface sigma, uh, so our functor is f, yeah. so for each surface sigma, f of sigma is some vector space, and you're meant to think of that as the Hilbert space of quantum mechanical states uh, on, uh, on a system of the shape given by that surface. And then uh, for each three manifold m, now there's three manifolds that have boundary, and you should think of this boundary as having an incoming and outgoing piece. So these are both surfaces. Uh, the, the morphism part of the functor gives you a linear map, f of m, which is a map from the Hilbert uh, space of the incoming boundary to the Hilbert space of the boundary. Yeah, that's meant to describe it. Okay, and as I said, everyone I think is, is very uh, familiar with by now. Uh, this is sort of the original setup, the idea of, of topological quantum computing. Uh, you, you want to work in a, in a function disk. So now uh, your TQFT hands you some Hilbert space associated with a disk with some number of punctures, and you're thinking of that as the, the place where you're storing your quantum information and doing uh, <coughs> work. And then when you want to implement some quantum algorithm, which from the mathematician's point of view, someone just comes along and hands you a unitary operator and says, please implement this, you realize that um, there, are, there are particularly nice cobordisms of the function disk to itself by moving the holes around, so there's a, this is about a three manifold. You think of the braid as being uh, tubes drilled out inside the three manifold. This gives you nice operators and the spaces, and of course, in nice examples, you can approximate arbitrary unitary space <coughs> by the radius. And off we go. Okay. That's, uh, that's all very well. Okay. Now, uh, I'm personally particularly interested in, uh, in what you call local field theory. And I realize that some physicists are going to uh, think that that's a sign of, of bad taste and that I'm uh, avoiding thinking about the interesting things and instead going and looking at the, the boring things. But, well, that's a, as a mathematician, the, the local field theory is the one that I'm interested in. Okay, so for a local field theory, uh, that function that we talked about that gives us vector spaces and linear maps also has to, has to associate some further algebraic data to, to mathematics. And in particular, 
three one manifolds, and one manifolds are just disjoint unions of circles and intervals. Uh, it's meant to give us, it's meant to spit out some category. And associated to the point, there's only there's only really one zero manifold, which is disjoint unions of points, really just the point. It's meant to spit out some tensor category. Okay. And, and local media that, that it's telling us stuff all the way down to the point. So I'll make the distinction later between local and extended. Extended only goes down to one manifold, and local goes all the way down to the point. Okay. So all of that data that the TQFT is meant to associate to, to different uh, manifolds is all meant to fit together nicely. Uh, back in the original version where we just said a TQFT was a functor, that's <coughs> the, the condition there is that when you have two three manifolds and you glue them together end to end, the linear maps you get are meant to just compose to give you the linear map for the whole thing. And so we have to say something analogous to that for the lower, di lower dimensional stuff. <coughs> and this is one good way of saying <coughs> what you want from the local field theory. So suppose we've got some, some k-manifold, and k can be either 1 or 2 or 3, so we're doing this at all the different levels, so you can think here. And uh, we, we pick some way to split that manifold into two pieces. So what you'd imagine cutting this genus 2 surface along a circle here, and so we have two punctured toroid being glued together along the surface. Oh. Well, the, the TQFT then assigns stuff to all the pieces, it assigns stuff to the, to the two manifolds on either side, and assign some higher algebraic object to the, the locus we're cutting along. And the rule is just that you should be able to produce this object as a um, sort of amalgamated tensor product of the, the two pieces uh, tensored over the, the action of the object that, uh, that uh, is associated with the cutting Yeah. Uh, sorry, just to, this is the same tensor product that Vaughn talked about. Yeah, yeah. So this <coughs> means we've got equivalence classes of this circle and this circle. That's what it basically means to glue. Yeah, I mean, is that so the idea? You should be thinking that maybe sort of uh, if this guy uh, is a module, uh, maybe let's say, oh, oh yeah, oh, yeah. So different uh, you should think that uh, so f of the puncture torus, oh, that makes it worse, doesn't it? Is a module uh, m over uh, some ring. R, or well, ring, or algebra, or doesn't, we'll just say ring for now. And this is the that you obtain from the circle, and then uh, and then f of this other piece uh, is another module. Let's say let's call that one n. And then what we're saying there is you, you're meant to get the answer by taking m tensor with n over r, and by definition this is just like in Horn's talk. This is just the usual tensor product over the complex numbers, modular the relation that uh, m r tensor n equals m tensor r n. And in terms of the, the field theory, you should just be thinking that uh, this is saying you can slice up a little curve <coughs> of the boundary here and move it across to the other place, and that shouldn't change uh, the element of the, of the gadget you're talking about. Okay. So, that's a, a heuristic version of what a local field theory is. All this high algebraic data associated with the manifolds and satisfying some gluing formula, which in every dimension is just a, a, t a tensor product uh, over some gadget that, that corresponds to the main things. <coughs> so intuitively, just what the deep, that deep product means is that actually gluing it on that circle and nowhere else. Uh, yeah. So uh, we said, well, I said back here that associated with the point, we had a tensor category. Uh, this is maybe unnecessary for, for people here, but so let's just say it quickly. Just some examples, so you know what sort of things I'm talking about at this point. The category of all vector spaces is a very nice tensor category. Uh, you, could, uh, you could also look at a, the representation theory of, say, a compact group, where you, can, uh, where you can take the tensor product of two representations as vector spaces, but when I make it a representation again, to count as a tensor category, and of course you have that group element on a tensor product by just acting uh, separately in each factor. <coughs> there are uh, other examples coming from more, more complicated representation theory. This is the representation categories of quantized universal enveloping algebras, or, or representation theory of affine Lie algebras, which is something similar. Uh, or you can have uh, diagrammatic examples. So, uh, 
Uh, here, the, the temporary leap category is something where the objects, the natural numbers, which you think of as just being some number of points along the line, and then the morphisms. So here, I'm, I guess I've drawn pictures of the morphisms from the object two to the object four. I guess these diagrams, these embedded one manifolds in a rectangle. And the, all the operations in the tensor category are just defined diagrammatically to compose morphisms, you stack them vertically, and to take tensor products of morphisms and stick them side by side. Uh, and you have to you have to to do something sensible here. You have to impose a relation that any time you see a closed circle, you can remove it from multiple loop factors. Okay. So lots of interesting examples that you can just write down by by describing some diagrams, modular local relations. Um, this one in particular is actually an instance of, of a special case of these guys. But there'll be many interesting ones here that are that are, that are not like the ones you've done. Okay. And more examples to come. So just a little bit um, about tensor categories. I guess I said a little bit of this. Uh, you can draw planar diagrams representing the morphisms where uh, composition in the tensor category is implemented by stacking the diagram and tensor products by putting them side by side. And the important thing, the, the, exactly what the axioms of a tensor category tell you, uh, that if you've got two diagrams which are related by a planar isotopy, then they must represent exactly the same morphism. So here's sort of a boring way of writing something, and here's a planar isotopy of the same diagram, I'm just sort of moving things around like this. And now this is something exceedingly complicated, sort of, as I scan up the page here, maybe I should have drawn it, in a, drawn it a little bit differently, as you scan up the page here, maybe you get this critical point for here first, and so you need to use some, uh, some sort of pairing or co-pairing map on the object from the tensor category to create two lines, and then you use this morphism with the identity maps on the other side, and so on. And so writing that down algebraically can be very complicated, but the axioms of the tensor category are just to say that the diagrams are isotopic when they must be. Okay. So this is just, I guess, an observation about things that people were saying yesterday. If you're interested in planar tensor networks, you can do them in any tensor in any tensor category, and the usual case is just tensor networks. Uh, yeah. So maybe elaborating on that just a little bit more. Uh, so usually in a tensor network. You think of the strings as carrying a copy of, of, of a d-dimensional vector space, and the boxes just carry arbitrary tensors uh, of the appropriate rank depending on the number of strings. But um, instead, what you you should do if you're working in some other uh, some other tensor category, you should think of the boxes as being labeled by say there are no strings on the bottom of your box and n strings on the top. You should just think of the boxes as being labeled by elements of the home space from the tensor identity to the nth tensor power of your object. And this thing, uh, this can this thing can look more complicated than just some arbitrary tensor. Uh, for example, uh, the dimension of this space of boxes you put in, uh, at least in a semi-simple tensor category, will grow exponentially with the number of strings attached to the box. But the base of that exponent doesn't need to be an integer anymore, unlike the case in, in, uh, of tensor network sitting. Okay. So, it's, okay. so it's, a, it's a it's a generalization away from tensor network. Where you don't, you put other objects besides tensors in the boxes, but you also have instructions for doing contractions and other kind of operations. Okay, on we go. Now, uh, the, our, our topological field theory associates stuff to all different uh, dimensions, and in particular, the tensor category it associates to the point just determines it. Okay, once you've said that, once you've said what tensor category you want at the bottom, you have no choices about what to do at the top. The glowing formulas tell you everything that, that, uh, that went on at the top. Okay, so uh, this is sort of a very, by now, a very general setting for understanding this sort of situation. This is the cobordism hypothesis proved by Lurie in the last couple of years. And what you can, what the, 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 the quick takeaway message from the cobordism hypothesis is if you've got a local field theory in n dimensions, it's completely determined by its value of that value of the point is some n category. Okay, today we're just going to have a, a tensor category, but the general story says you can have an n category of the point. And Lurie spells out exactly what sort of n category is allowed. There's some condition he calls fully dualizable. Only, the, what it, only those n categories are allowed as the values of the points. And in fact, every such fully dualizable n category can be used to build a, a local field. So, so this gives a 
I'm not telling you what fully dualizable is, and it's kind of complicated and a bit long-winded, uh, but this gives a complete classification. It just says that local field theories and interdimensions are just given by fully dualizable inheritance, whatever the hell that's in. Now, Can you give us some intuition for this? Yeah, okay, yep, yep. Uh, fully dualizable is actually a pun. Uh, it's, uh, the, the acronym is FD, which is the same as finite dimension. And it's meant to be a, uh, a sort of generalization of the notion of finite dimension. In particular, if you do this in the n equals zero case, fully dualizable uh, ends up actually meaning sort of a finite dimensional vector space. You know, all the way through, fully dualizable always has a, has a very finite. So let me uh, uh, give some examples. So since Murray gave us this abstract nonsense, people have been going through, in particular, dimensions and explaining what fully dualizable actually means. And uh, uh, Douglas and Snyder and Shoma Freeze have recently told us what fully dualizable means in the case n equals 2. Uh, and uh, and they're, the, they're fully dualizable tensor categories are exactly the, the fusion categories. Excuse me. Oh, yeah. Can you yeah. also please give an example of the first sentence there, the tensor category of the point, or what just specify the structure defined on the point? Yeah. And then it's all the higher structure. Can you give an example of it? Um, In which sense? Yeah. Well, I, I don't exactly know what what structure you provide when you specify a focal point. Okay. Um, the yeah. I'm not entirely certain what sort of answer to give. Uh, I mean, for example, I could I can tell you explicitly if you if you said what uh, what you associate to a point, you have to associate to a circle then, and, and that's very simple, which is just that um, the value on S1 is just the Drinfeld center. Of the of the value uh, on a point. So when you, on the point, uh, sorry. Is there? Is there yeah. so, so in particular, uh, can you relate it to the yeah. Torah code? <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sure. Yeah. So um, yes, the Torah code definitely definitely sits in here. So for the Torah code, um, f of a point is just. Um, it's just the representation category of, of, uh, of Z1, 2, Z, okay? So which is a very boring representation category. It's just got the trivial and the sign representation of Z1, 2, Z. It's a, a little tensor category with, with uh, two simple objects. If, if I try to say it in a physics language, yeah. is this the case? No, 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 yeah, no, no this is yeah, a question. Yeah. Like, yeah. Is it that you, you have to identify some topological symmetry, and that's what is characterizing this thing? So, um, like in these ZD gauge theories, yep. the answer is rep Z mod DZ. Yeah, more so generally, I, and and so yeah, so we should the, think of like, these uh, all the. Uh, I guess I, I mean I can tell you some more examples like the all the the, the diagram women things are all yeah. are all G graded vector spaces of the things that you associate to a point. Uh, Are they for, local gauge symmetries? Uh, yeah, not, not sure what, okay. uh, what the answer is. Yeah, it's not just yeah, the, the simplest example of from if uh, f of the point is just the complex numbers, what is f of the same? Oh, you can't have the complex numbers, no? but you can have you can have vector spaces, the collection of all vector spaces. f of a point is a category. It's, it's a, already a category. Yeah, okay. yeah so f of a point is a whole category. So, yeah, yeah so you, you can certainly take f of a point. Uh, to be fair, and then everything is boring. Uh, the um, f of the circle um, is, um, what was f of the circle meant to be, was also just fair, but no longer thought of as a tensor category, just as a, just as a category, and uh, f of any surface uh, is the complex numbers. So yes, that's the, that's the boring example. Um, can you repeat the no, question? Uh, is, it, sorry, is, the, is the Z2 of the Tory code just related to the up-down spin of, a, of, a, of the same? Um, 
No, I mean, uh, you, can, you can certainly, uh, starting with any fusion category, well, maybe let me get to a slide or two in, in advance and I'll tell you more about when and when fusion categories and so what, this, what this means end up. Okay, so even better than this, uh, than this correspondence between local 2D field theories and fusion categories, uh, there's, there's the stuff that uh, the physicists uh, have to be rude and say rediscovered um, <laughs> in the Levin Wayne model. Uh, that if you start with a fusion category, you can take that as explicit, in, you can, you can sort of read that as explicit instructions for writing down a local Hamiltonian. Uh, who, so, so you take your surface and you write some graph on the, on the, on the surface, and then the fusion category tells you how to put a, uh, associate a Hilbert space because you're being tensor product of little, of little vector spaces associated to each, in general, to each uh, vertex edge and face uh, of, the, of the graph and a Hamiltonian on all, on all that, so that the ground state of that Hamiltonian is this, is this TFD uh, vector space. And uh, there's this very sad thing that uh, everything was done by Ockniani sometime in the 80s, and uh, we've all been rediscovering it since then. Uh, he sort of wrote everything down rather impenetrably. Uh, but uh, his description of how you do this construction in the, in the two-dimensional case really is the Lenormand -Len model. He really writes down a family of commuting projections and says to take a common kernel and to build a surface. Okay. And uh, he doesn't do more. What's that? <laughs> he doesn't do more? What? Uh, uh, well, who knows? Uh, and you want to know which paper to write? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so, Really, to do the next slide justice, I should take the whole hour, but let me see if I can say something. Um, what I want to say is that the, the live and when sort of description of how you write down a local Hamiltonian is an immediate consequence of the gluing formula that we know holds in a, in a TFT. And that gluing formula is telling you exactly how to write down uh, the, the Hamiltonian. So the idea is that we're going to look at our surface and draw some graph on it. So here's my surface just with a graph drawn on it. And I don't care at all about it being regular or a lattice or anything like that. Just anything you like. Maybe all of the faces have to be, have to be um, contracted or something like that. <coughs> okay. And the idea is I'm going to build my manifold now, my whole surface, by first of all putting in little balls around the vertices and then gluing in uh, handles connecting the vertices of, along the edges. And then finally I'm going to glue in balls corresponding to all the faces of my and I'm going to iteratively use the gluing formula for the TFT to realize that I can compute the invariant of the K skeleton. So the K skeleton, this is the zero skeleton, that's the one skeleton, that's the two skeleton. I can iteratively compute the, uh, the vector space associated with the K skeleton by a gluing formula, by taking whatever I've got for the K minus one skeleton, and then gluing all of the balls in dimension K along some piece of the boundary. Now, the point is that uh, these guys are extremely simple. These are just uh, the, the TFT applied to, a, applied to a ball, and we know exactly uh, what that is. And then whatever this tensor product is, well, uh, it's, it's some complicated, scary tensor product over, over some ring or some category. Uh, but you can, uh, but of course, that, that tensor product we're meant to get is, is a quotient of the, of the nice, easy, boring tensor product of the complex numbers. And essentially, when you're working over a category rather than just a ring, first of all, there's a matching condition. You're, you're really meant to take something in here and something in here that, that, that match up. So there's some terms you put in the Hamiltonian to insist that you project onto the pieces that have matching boundary conditions. And then you have another type of term in the Hamiltonian that, uh, um, that, that forces this equation, that, that cuts you down to, a, to, a, to the quotient, uh, or maybe just a ring, a choice of section of the, the quotient. Uh, and when you just follow this recipe, following the gluing formula, you get something more complicated than Levin and Wren would write down, because it, again, the Hilbert space is a tensor product over zero cells, one cells, and two cells. And there are, in this case, maybe six times of Hamiltonian terms, matching terms, and quotient terms at each level. But usually you can simplify a whole lot and get rid of things. And uh, you can, you can sort of, in, in cases, in simple cases, recover the Levin and Wren quotient. Yeah. So, um, and a nice thing to, to say about this perspective on how you get the Hamiltonian uh, is that it's not a, it, there's nothing two-dimensional about it. You can do this 
by building, if you've got an n-dimensional field theory, you can build up your, your manifold via handle decomposition like this, and iteratively compute your TFT invariant by, by building a level at a time. And as long as uh, there are some sort of sufficient semi-simplicity semi conditions on, on all the categories you see, you can turn this tensor product formula into an explicit formula for, for continuous projection. So we'll, we'll pick up the TFT space. And, and this, what I'm saying here is, is, um, is definitely Kevin Walker's idea, it's not mine, uh, but he, he doesn't seem to have written it down in the Walker or Walker paper, but this is sort of how he explains it to mathematicians. Excuse me? Yeah. How, how, why are we talking about tunnel now? Yeah. So uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, no, no particular reason. No, 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 <laughs> that's, that's fine, but I think, so, so if you talk about the Hanover diamond, probably then you add more than what you had before. Before you wanted to talk about this and now yeah, 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 yeah. I, you have excitations. So yeah. The global space has been increased at the ground state of this Hanover diamond would yep. buy what you wanted. Yep, yep, yeah, the, it, yeah, so just the ground state gives you back the piece that you wanted. Uh, I mean, I think the, the interesting thing here is that in this recipe, uh, going from the gluing formula to the projections. Uh, there are some choices, but there aren't that many choices in, in writing down the, the, the Hamiltonian you can get. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it there. Okay, so, just a question. Yeah. So the, the three-dimensional um, Lemon Wayne models, or the Walker Wayne models, yeah. uh, again, they just have, they just have like a vertex term and, and then a, and a top cat term. Yeah. yeah. So there's no sort of like three yeah, um, and so here, um, I forget which terms disappear for which reasons, but uh, um, the, usually, uh, so uh, let's say this. You can, think of a, uh, you can think of a tensor category as a particular type of two category uh, that's only got one object at the bottom level. And I think in all of the, whenever you've got that sort of degeneracy like that, sort of a unique thing in some bottom levels, a bunch of terms from the Hamiltonian disappear. And so this general, this recipe here is sort of, I mean, is for the most general setting, and you automatically lose a bunch of terms when you simplify the things by just one object. But I don't, I don't have to sit down with exactly which terms disappear for reasons. Okay, so, um, yeah, okay, so the, I only wanted to say this as a to, to, to indicate that the, uh, the gluing rule at the level of the, the TFT uh, really tells you how to how to write down this condition. Is is this the lattice that you draw there actually? The yeah, so the ring was meant to be the lattice. So because the eleven winner is always on a hexagonal lattice. But yeah, there's no need for any regularity at all. I, I mean, you'll have uh, the the terms will look different. If you've got a five valent vertex, there'll be a different Hamiltonian sitting there than a, than a six valent vertex. But you can mix and match and still get the ground state as you want. Okay, okay, okay. So, um, that all aside, I've, I've said that uh, these guys proved that fully dualizable tensor categories are the fusion categories. So now let's go and say exactly what fusion means and, uh, and go and start studying. So, a fusion category is a finitely semi simple tensor category. We've talked about tensor categories before, just by giving a bunch of examples. So I need to explain what finitely semi-simple means. And finitely semi-simple is, uh, is sort of just a very nice condition, and an unsurprising one. So it tells you that every object in your category uh, can be written as a direct sum of some class of objects we'll call the simple objects. And uh, there are only finitely many such simple objects. And uh, the requirement on our class of simple objects is just this, that there are no maps between two simple objects unless they're the same simple object. And in that case, there's just a one-dimensional space of maps between those objects. Now, that's not the usual mathematician's notion of semi-simplicity, uh, but over the complex numbers, this is equivalent to the, to the standard notion. So, that's fine. Uh, okay, uh, and it's important to note that um, the that finitely semi-simple tensor category, a fusion category, is something that you can write down with finitely much algebraic data. Even though this equivalence tells us its equivalent is TFT, which is a really complicated thing, you can write down finitely many symbols on a piece of paper. I've said everything about, uh, about that. Let's just look at a, a few examples. We'll first look at some, some non-examples. Uh, lots of representation categories don't count here. 
you can look at representations of a finite group over a finite field. Typically, that won't be semi simple. So if you, you don't like those, you can look at uh, things like uh, representation categories of compact D groups. <coughs> you don't like those because although they're semi simple, they're going to have infinitely many simple objects. So they're out as well. Uh, and then the examples uh, are things more like this. So here are sort of the, the classical examples of, of fusion categories. It's just the category of vector spaces, with the, which has just got one simple object, the complex numbers. Uh, we can look at uh, G-graded vector spaces, uh, maybe with twisted by some homological data, uh, like, like the stuff that shows up in, uh, in symmetry projected phases, I think. Uh, you can look at the representation category of a finite group, where the simple objects just means the irreducible representations, and there are as many as there are confusing classes. So in particular, there are finite many. And then you can also get some more exciting ones coming from quantum groups and roots of unity. Uh, so here's a picture. Usually, the irreducible representations of a, of, a, uh, of a quantum group are indexed by points in some big cone, lattice points in some big cone. When you look at a root of unity, you get a cutoff somewhere, and only finite things can survive. And so, for example, like uh, the, the category, the, the, the golden category, the Fibonacci category, is an example of one of these quantum things. Okay. One thing to notice uh, here is that some of these examples were, were braided or symmetric, and some of them weren't. I mean, for example, in, in, uh, in rep G, representations of a finite group, V tends to W is isomorphic to W tends to V in the obvious way. In these quantum group guys, it's a braided category. But in other of these examples, there's just neither a braiding nor a symmetry. Uh, for example, the, the G graded vector spaces when you have a, a group that's not commutative. There's just no braiding, there's no symmetry. Okay, so what else could there be besides uh, these classical examples coming from, coming from representation theory? Well, what do we know about how to produce fusion categories? Uh, we've got, a, at this point, a bunch of constructions. We have ways of producing new fusion categories from old. So let me just list a few to give a flavor. Uh, you can take uh, tensor products of fusion categories. I think that physicists is called this stacking. Uh, you, can, you can take a full subcategory, you just, just take some, some subset of the objects that are closed under the tensor product. Uh, when you've got a, uh, a finite group acting by automorphisms on a tensor category, there's this equivariantization process, which is like a, a categorical version of taking fixed points. Uh, I forget what the <coughs> physics word for that one is. Uh, one thing that to, to note here is that lots of these ones have physics words, but usually those are uh, the corresponding constructions over for modular tensor categories where we have gradients. And here we're talking about the setting without gradients. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily match up. Okay. Uh, gauging? Okay. Call it gauging. And the next one, uh, if you have a, a subcategory that looks like the representation theory of a finite group, sometimes you can, but not always, you can push it down by that, by that G. And I think this is probably called condensation. Okay. Uh, but in the fusion category case, this isn't, it isn't automatic you can do this. There are, there are some complicated conditions uh, about the way this sits inside C before you can do it. And then uh, there's a very beautiful classification of categories graded by G. So here, category G graded by G means that ignoring the tensor product structure is just a direct sum of different subcategories indexed by elements of the group. And then the tensor product sort of respects the group operation. So if you tensor things in sitting over G with things sitting over H, you get something sitting over, over G times H. And uh, there's a lovely homotopy theoretic classification. If you tell me G and you tell me the, the trivial piece, the piece sitting over the identity of the group, they tell you how to, any object you can also tell you how to produce everything. And I think the, uh, the classification uh, in Parsons' talk is, is very closely related to the classification result that they gave. That they gave to. Okay, so we have these methods of producing new things from all, but it's really completely unsatisfactory in the sense that uh, there's no structure theory going on for, for fusion categories. We don't have any way to say, oh yeah, you can decompose fusion categories into smaller pieces that satisfy this additional axiom, and you can build them up in the following way. Uh, like, uh, we do have, on the other hand, that sort of theory for finite groups, where you can talk about how finite groups are built out of simple groups by group extensions. And although we have some notions of extensions, quotients, and so on, uh, there's nothing like that at this point. This is sort of the, the big horrible problem we're stuck uh, at, uh, at, at getting towards some good structure theory. 
Well, even without the structure theory, we can wonder uh, from the representation theoretic examples that we have available, and then applying all these constructions as often as we like, maybe we can just build up everything uh, from that. And, and so the one question becomes, are there more interesting fusion categories besides the things that came from representation theoretic origins? Okay, and, and the answer is just no. Uh, there, are, there are definitely fusion categories out there that are more exotic than, than coming from representation theory. And uh, the, the examples um, essentially were, were all first discovered in the subfactor literature. So one, one nice example is this thing called the, the Hargrove subfactor. And I'm not going to go into what subfactors are. Pairs of one Romanov numbers, one sitting inside the other. And you can, but from a subfactor, you can extract a category that is often, but not always, a fusion category. Uh, you think of it, these guys are just algebras. So you can think about all of the MN bimodules. That's some big category, and it turns out it's a tensor category. And if you look at the subcategory generated by, the, by M as an NN bimodule, often that thing is a fusion category. So from the Hargrove subfactor, we do get a fusion category. And it turns out you can see that it's genuinely new, that it doesn't come from any of these representation theories. So just as a, a little indication of what this means without saying all the details, uh, it, uh, it's got, uh, you can think of, of this category, it comes with a, a special object M. And if you look at the dimensions of the, of the box spaces, maps from the tensor identity to some tensor power of n, you can calculate those dimensions by looking at, at loops on this funny little graph. And, uh, that, that's encoding all of the fusion rules uh, in this map. So this is some example of a, of a tensor category of an object uh, whose dimension is not a not a okay. So how do we know that this thing is new? If you, there isn't some secret way of building this uh, from the, the examples we had before. Well, uh, it turns out you can you can use some number theory, and this is a a bit surprising, and maybe particularly surprising for people who uh, sort of do numerical calculations and so on. Uh, but fusion categories are just extremely rigid objects, and uh, and part of that rigidity is that uh, is that you can use number theoretic invariance often as ways to to tell them apart and, and show things that show things aren't related. So, so the statement is just that all of the things coming from representation theoretic origins, you can define them over a cyclotomic field. And one way of making that explicit is you can just always write down the 6J symbols so that the entries in, this, in the 6J symbols are integer linear combinations of roots and measure. Okay? And for that, that part of the sentence is old news. That's 100 years old. Uh, that's just classical stuff. Uh, but what you can show is that it's just impossible to do that with the, the fusion category coming from the hover. You can, you can build invariants of the tensor category uh, that, uh, that, are, that are in the ground field that everything's defined over, uh, but you can show a, show a nice one. And since all of the constructions we have available uh, don't care if you're working over the complex numbers, they'll let you sort of deal with fusion categories over any field at all, all of those constructions preserve the field of definition, and so that shows us that we can't build this guy from, from things that, that, that did work over, over single time. Oh. So that's, uh, I don't know, either alarming or, alarming or exciting, depending on your point of view, uh, what's going on with this high group fusion category. And uh, at this point, uh, we sort of recognize that it's not just something sitting by itself, it's part of some family. And so people now call these guys quadratic categories. So, uh, well, Quadratic categories, uh, let me see how to say it. Um, in, a, in, a, in a fusion category, you can talk about the invertible objects. That's just the objects that have dimension one. And now they form a group. When you multiply two things with dimension one, it has dimension one again. And it's got an inverse, which also has dimension one. And so you can think about the orbits of, you look at all objects, and now think about multiplying on the left and right by the invertible guys. And look at the, look at the double cosets. You look at all the invertible, all the objects, and think about multiplying on the left and right by invertible objects. And the quadratic category is just one where there are only two double cosets. So there's the invertible objects, and then one other class of simple objects beside those. So um, the Hagra, uh has, uh, has this property. It turns out this guy, this guy, and this guy are all invertible objects. And under, 
the action of multiplying by those guys, these three simple objects here, uh, form, form a single organism. It's just two, two cosets in that. Um, similarly, the, uh, the Fibonacci category is the same. It's just got, uh, or it's even simpler there, just two objects in the Fibonacci category. One of them is invertible, one isn't, so it's, so it's really quite bad. Okay, uh, now, it's not that we have a classification of quadratic categories. We have a pretty good idea of, of what they look like. Um, if you tell me what group you want for the invertible objects, then you can write down some polynomial equations, some <laughs> categories are in one-to-one -one correspondence with solutions with no gauge symmetry or anything like that. So we can get some handle on these. Okay. So, uh, <coughs> uh, okay, so we, we, we found this first new example that was outside of the representation theoretic examples. It belongs in some family. What else is there? Uh, so this is the part where, where I've been uh, most involved We've, we've been attempting to just go looking for fusion categories, see what's out there, uh, finding, finding explicit examples, and trying to prove classifications. Of course, you can't do the whole classification, but what you can do is filter by some measure of size, and then try and enumerate all the possible fusion categories up to, that, up to some size, according to that measure of size. See what's out there. So there are a bunch of different ways you can filter. So uh, one is the, the global dimension of a fusion category. So every object in a fusion category has some dimension. It's not necessarily an integer. You can look at the sum of the squares of the dimensions. Those are criminally statistic uh, guys. And so we can now classify fusion categories with global dimension at most 37 and a half, uh, with an extra, extra proviso that we have to assume there are no subcategories, which is a bit of a, a, bit of a silly proviso but necessary. For now, 37 and a half isn't very big. If your fusion category was just the representation theory of a finite group, this global dimension is just the size of the group. Classifying finite groups up to size 37 and a half isn't so bad, sort of an undergraduate finite group theory course, you should be able to do that. So the problem over in fusion categories is much, much harder than the, the classical case uh, of, of finite groups. Um, you can also, another, another way you can, you can measure the size of a fusion category you can pick a favorite object in the fusion category, assume that that favorite object tensor generates, that is, everything in the, every single object in the, in the fusion category uh, appears inside some tensor power of your favorite object. And, uh, and now you can assume that that favorite object has small dimension itself. So in, uh, in sort of terms of uh, finite groups, it's like asking for a group that admits an irreducible representation of small dimension. Categorical and all of that. Or like a faithful. Uh, yes, and a faithful representation as well. Yeah, yeah the faithful is exactly the difference again. Uh, and so we can we can prove uh, a theorem along those lines. Uh, this number somehow 2.29 looks awfully small when you uh, when you look at it. Since uh, everything up to two is really easy, 2.29 is kind of close to two. Nevertheless, I think this result here now reflects the output of seven or eight papers, so it's, uh, uh, it's a bit of a long slog making even small progress in these classifications. And even here, there's, a, uh, there's some expert acronyms I won't even expand out uh, into a, a further description. And then uh, you can also try filtering fusion categories according to size, just how many simple objects there are in the fusion category. And it gets bad quite fast. Um, we, we can't quite do the rank four case at this point, where we're, we're almost there. Okay, so there have been these attempts to go searching for fusion categories by, by doing classifications and limited regimes. And we find examples, but then whenever we find examples, we go and look back and see if they're genuinely new or if they're built by these standard constructions from things we saw before. And here's the remarkable observation at this point. That at this point, everything we've ever seen is a fusion category. Either it comes from representations of finite groups or representations of quantum groups or this class of quadratic categories. Absolutely everything that we've ever seen can be built out of those three classes. Well, with two or three closely related exceptions. Um, these fusion categories, EH1 and EH2, that again come from some sub-factor uh, and uh, have a, a kind of intricate and complicated construction that's not very well understood. And we don't know yet. There's a possible third one that's related to these guys that no one has either confirmed or denied as yet. So uh, it's a little bit hard to know what to make of, 
of this phenomenology, uh, you might very ambitiously conjecture that um, exotic fusion categories, that is, fusion categories not coming from these sources, are very few and far between. Maybe there's finite lists of sporadic examples. That would probably be unreasonable, uh, and I think that it's more likely that the status reflects our very limited ability to go searching for them. It's probably more reasonable to suspect it's going to be a huge, very messy zoo of fusion categories right about there. We're just seeing the start of this zoo. But it's unclear. It's, uh, it's, it's definitely uh, an open question. Uh, what time am I meant to stop? Yeah, 15 minutes. OK, OK. So let me, uh, yeah, okay, let me, I was not sure whether to say the next slide or two, but let me quickly do this. I just wanted to, maybe I should have also done this earlier, I wanted to talk about modular categories as well as fusion categories. Perhaps for people who are happier thinking about modular categories, this will explain a little bit, uh, give a bit more context to what I've been talking about. Okay, so, uh, so a modular category, remember, is an n well, It doesn't matter if you remember or not, I'll, I'll tell you. Uh, it's a, it's a fusion category with some extra objects, uh, braided and pivotal. So uh, pivotal, is, pivotal is, a, is an interesting adjective. Uh, when, when back at the beginning of the day, I said that uh, diagrams <coughs> representing morphisms in the tensor category uh, uh, didn't depend on planar isotopes. If you performed a planar isotope, you got back exactly what you started with. That's not entirely true, because in a general fusion category, there's no reason why uh, the, the two pi rotation of some morphism has to be what you start with. Okay? And pivotality uh, is exactly the assertion that the two pi rotations uh, are also allowed in the class of planar isotopes. Okay, something on your um, the, last line. the last line is going to come from the bottom. Right. Okay. That's just, this is just a two pi twist. Pivotality is, is this x -pass. Amusingly, uh, there are no known examples of fusion categories that aren't pivotal. It's possible that the pivotal is redundant to axiom, but it's apparently necessary. Um, and then graded, I think you know, uh, graded is just the existence of this graded in mass family of isomorphisms with mu tensor w to w tensor v satisfying and axiom. And then finally, the, the modularity condition is just that if you build this matrix, whose entries are the values of the hop link labeled by the symbol objects i and j, then that matrix you get is, is incorrect. Now, viewed very narrowly, uh, these things are a subset of all of the fusion categories. We took fusion categories and added a whole bunch of ridiculous attitudes. But it's probably the wrong way to think about the relationship between graded tensor categories and uh, between, sorry, between modular categories and fusion categories. So the, the mathematical statements are are the following. So first of all, there's this construction there, this algebraic construction, the Drinfeld center, that takes a pivotal fusion category and produces something modular, the set of C. Now, back in the, the TFT picture, if you had your TFT, your local TFT associated with the fusion category C, then that Drinfeld center is exactly what you associate to the, to the circle. And in fact, actually, the top part of the TFT can barely see the choice you made down at the point. The values on the three and two and one dimensional manifolds actually are completely determined by this modular category associated with the circle. And they can't tell which choice you made down all the way down at the point. As long as you know what the center is, that fixes everything else up the top. And so in fact, uh, a very recently proved theorem <coughs> that I think people had uh, had been expecting for a long time, and physicists had, uh, had certainly been expecting, but uh, turns out it's kind of, kind of subtle uh, to prove in the end. Uh, the extended TFTs, so these are not local ones, they only go down to, to one dimension, are in fact determined by whatever value they take on the circle, and that value is in the modular category. Very, very reassuring, it's what we knew all along. Now, uh, several different fusion categories can have the same Greenfield center. And you can characterize exactly when they, they have the same thing. So given all of that, you should think of, of this picture. We have, as before, local field theories uh, corresponding to fusion categories. And you have the extended field theories, which is some weaker notion, corresponding to modular categories. You can always take a local field theory and forget that it's defined on the point, And that gives you a, an extended field theory. 
And similarly, you can always take a fusion category and, uh, and take its mean field center and get a modulation. And so uh, these maps here, fusion categories to modular categories or local field theories to extended field theories, aren't injective. So you can't really think of fusion categories as being a subset of modular categories, the opposite direction of what, of what is literally true. But it's almost true. There's only a finite ambiguity here. And so perhaps, perhaps it's, it is nice to think up to this finite ambiguity of fusion categories actually being a smaller class uh, of the modular categories. Uh, so that all said, they, so why on earth do I care about fusion categories when everyone knows that modular categories are an inter interesting thing and the modular categories determine all the apparently interesting bits of the TFT? Why the hell do we ever do this and think about these guys now? Well, partly it's just that uh, we have much better tools at this point for constructing interesting fusion categories, or if not interesting, at least previously unknown fusion categories, than we do have for producing new modular tensor categories, which seems to be extremely so one way to get a new modular tensor category is to go away and, and uh, discover new fusion categories and then take centers and get the, the new modular tensor categories. Now, this, is, uh, this, this middle box here is a question. I don't think it's a conjecture in either direction, really. But you can think about uh, this thing called the, the WIT group. So let's take all of the unitary modular tensor categories and think about well, the physicists would just say stacking, so taking, taking tensor products of modular tensor categories. This thing here um, certainly isn't a group. There's, not, there's no notion of the inverse of a modular tensor category here. It's just some model you can just keep stacking these things. But what you can do is try and push it down by centers. Okay? So just take the, in this monoid, push it out by the ideal generated by the centers of all the fusion categories. And a lovely result of um, David O. Rostrick, probably someone else, um, is that this becomes a group uh, once you've taken it into this question. So you can think of sort of modular tensor categories up to centers, and, it, and it's a group. And the remarkable fact is that at the moment, uh, we don't know very many elements of this. That is, all of the, everything that we, that we know of in the, in the root group in this question came from a quantum group at some degree. So this is sort of saying that if you, if you want to look at modular tensor categories, but you think all the centers are boring, then you actually don't have that much to play with anymore, and everything might just be coming from one. Uh, I would guess this is not true, and that there are more, even that there are other generators, there are interesting modular tensor categories besides centers and, and quantum groups, but I think other people would go the other way. Uh, now, so as an example of maybe this, this first point, um, we had this, remember we had this interesting fusion category the extended, coming from extended hard work that's apparently unrelated to everything else in the universe. And we've, we've very recently, uh, with Terry Gannon, managed to compute uh, not all of the data of the modular category. We don't know the, the six J symbols and so on. But we do know the S and T matrices for this guy. And so we have some of the data of the, of the modular tensor category. And so this is maybe, this is sort of a, a new and exotic example. It's pretty big. It has 22 simple objects. Rather complicated. It's not likely to turn up in the lab any day now. Um, but uh, I think it's a, it's a nice illustration of the fact that uh, thinking about fusion categories can produce interesting modular tensor categories. OK, thank you. We have plenty of time for questions. Uh, I'm not sure if I got this right. Yeah. <coughs> Uh, maybe this, oh, the, the, the answer to this question is completely obvious, but is there a, dare I say, an 11 wing model for the extended hard work? Uh, sure. Well, so, so if you think about it as just a fusion category, forget right. about that modular stuff. Yeah, so it's some fusion category. So yeah, we can write down some lattice model for it. So it's so an Arcneano model. Yeah, yeah. Not, <laughs> not, not, uh, 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 would, it, would it be weird to compare it to what would, or what would distinguish it? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think the, the only thing that we have to separate 
from a, from a strict mathematical point of view, the only thing we have to separate the quadratic categories and the extended hyperopters from much more familiar examples is uh, these strange number theory that you asked, that they, they, they require more exotic fields of definition. Um, the, certainly, I mean, um, uh, the, the conjecture is just that um, <coughs> The conjecture is, is that it's easy to tell whether the center of a fusion category is universal for quantum computing, like whether the break group extends and so on. And the, the conjecture basically says all of these examples would be universal. There's nothing to better or worse in, in these examples. In small yeah. Is it this is an example where the, the resulting modular theory is not just a uh, discrete change theory or a double I'm not confident I understand the question, but I think the answer is that um, I think the answer is that most you, there's no reason to expect that most of these centers of, of strange fusion categories uh, will be. I, I think the translation I meant to be making is dis by discrete gauge theory. I meant to like they're, they're sort of dagger fusion uh, type things. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So th these are definitely not related to dagger fusion stuff. I mean, the, the non cyclotomic field aspect says you're very far from <coughs> and stuff. And then, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think all of the transcendence things are going to be back in this class coming from quantum groups. Certainly, they, they, they work over fields built out of roots of unity, so we're outside of this as well. Um, yeah, I, so, yeah, I mean, the, the centers of all the quadratic categories, essentially, or most of them. Sort of, uh, just as strange in those senses as, as extended hypothesis. Right? So I remember that a few years ago, some people were saying that it was conjecture whether uh, all modular tensor categories were characterized by their S and T matrices. Is this um, uniquely? Yeah, that, that's still open. Very, that's still open. Very recently, someone, this, uh, Eric Rao and some other people, discovered some examples of matrix, uh, uh, of, uh, and for a while it was a conjecture that even the T matrix was completely invariant of modular tensor categories. That's no longer true. We now know modular tensor categories are the same T matrix, but S and T are apparently a, a complete invariant. Although I have no idea how long this works. Yeah, I'm still trying to understand how yeah. the number theoretic <coughs> data yeah. manifests itself. Uh, yeah, let, let me draw a little picture. If you, if you remember uh, that little picture that I drew for, for, for <coughs> Hyperloop, uh, there were these six simple yeah. objects in Hyperloop. So here's the tensor identity, and here's some object maybe we'll call uh, M. And then the, the fusion rules in this tensor category is described by this graph. Adjacency on this graph means that if you tensor with, with a oh, copy of yeah. M, like if you take this guy tensor M, you get this plus this plus this plus this. Okay, so on. Okay. Oh, it really is just like root lattice. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, yeah. so in um, I don't know, so in this space, from you look at these these guys, these four boxes, these maps from nothing to four copies of M. Uh, there's a there are some special elements, uh, some nice elements. Which roughly correspond to remember that there was the, the, you, could, you could imagine a basis of this space that corresponded to paths on this graph. So anyway, you can extract a nice element of this guy that is um, that's well defined up to up to some overall scale. And so this is this guy here is some four box. So let's call it S. And so it looks like um, some some abstract version of a tensor with four box four legs coming out of it. And then you okay. can do something crazy like uh, there's some strange way of hooking up an S with itself three times. You've got to look pretty hard before you find these things. And I forget anyway. I've connected these up incorrectly. But you do some strange connection like this and divide this out by some other diagrams. Uh, Raised to suitable powers, 
and you showed that whatever this, this combination of evaluations of, sort of abstract tensor networks was, didn't depend on any of the choices you made, picking this element X and so on in here. And so whatever this number, this evaluates to some number, and it's got to be in the ground field, and you can just go and calculate it and see that it's not, uh, that this, evaluate, this ratio of evaluations of, of, of networks is not a cyclotomic number, it can't lie in a cyclotomic field. That shows that you can't possibly do it. What, what field does it lie in? It's um, some, uh, the, the Galois group is S3. It's just some, oh, some it's trying to do some abelian extension. Well, abelian is exactly the same as it was on. Yeah, the, the yeah that's what I mean. So, yeah, uh, so it's in a, but it's, in, not, or it's not sitting in an abelian extension of some other base field or something. Oh, such um, that it's, it's, maybe it's a split extension. I, I have to say, I forget that for this time. Any other questions? I just have one question. Um, yeah. So it seems like when I've seen uh, some of these examples in your talk, like, everything seems to have a, a countable number of objects. Oh, and just a countable wondering. number, a finite number of objects. Or a finite yeah. number of objects. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I'm just curious, like, say if you're looking at the quantum double of a continuous group. OK. Um, is there anything weird that happens in the fact that you have like, continuous group <coughs> classes? Oh, I mean, I mean so. Everything that I've been talking about is, was very much in the finitely semi-simple setting. And lots of the things I said sort of really rely on us having finitely semi-simple objects. On the other hand, um, uh, as some people in the audience sitting up there know, uh, another way of thinking about these gadgets is, is from the subfactor perspective. You can always realize these fusion categories as representation categories and subfactors. And there it's completely unnatural to put the, that finitely many simple object. And so I think some things along those lines that you might want to do, you can handle well in the in subfactor formalism that, that don't make sense in the dream kind of thing. OK, let's you, you can't get some deep lines. Uh, you, you can have things with infinitely many simple objects, but nevertheless have modular centers. That's possible. You can have finitely many symbols in, this, in the Vindvold center, even if the original <laughs> All right, let's thank Scott again. And next up is Norbert Schuh.